All right, welcome to your uh, 524 class logistic regression video. Um, the uh, scientists in this cartoon seem to have come up with an amazing finding. Uh, well, I, so my, um, what I will encourage you guys to, um, to do uh, with logistic regression is um, appreciate the process uh, and be curious about the mathematical um, underpinnings that, that uh, occur uh, to allow us to get from one step to the next. Um, I don't think this PowerPoint video necessarily, um, or the PowerPoint notes even, necessarily give you all the information, um, and perhaps not even the Tabachnik and Fidel book, um, as far as um, what maximum likelihood is and why we take uh, Euler's constant and natural logs and different things that um, allow us to analyze uh, discrete categorical um, uh, dependent variables uh, in the regression context. Um, so I encourage you guys to be skeptical of these methods, um, and I will also provide uh, a couple of supplemental supplemental um, materials um, uh, that will hopefully fill in the gaps for you just a little bit. Um, that said, if you are more interested in just getting to the end of the problem, um, then there is more than enough uh, information here, hopefully, to allow you to do that in your homework, and, uh, and also enough understanding to provide uh, you with um, uh, what you need to get through the uh, exam. Uh, so, hopefully I haven't scared you too much uh, with the, <laughs> maybe I've intrigued you a little bit with some of the, the terminology here uh, that we'll be going through in this video. Logistic regression, uh, by definition, is just a regression with a discrete um, dependent variable. Um, often this de uh, dependent variable is dichotomous, and so we'll go through uh, an example that I adapted from Tabachnik and Fidel. If you guys are following along the Tabachnik and Fidel chapter, uh, this they, they had... Um, some data in there. It was actually a skiing example in their book, um, but I decided that after a couple of years uh, of teaching through the skiing example, I was going to change it based on our uh, research that I've been doing in my lab um, on esports and online gaming. And so I, I switched this over um, to uh, look at um, the uh, prediction of whether someone is an online gamer or not, yes or no. Uh, so you might uh, just be forced to choose between yes or no. Uh, you could also rank yourself. Of course, you could imagine online gaming be a, being a continuous variable number of hours per day, something like this. Um, but we're going to call it a uh, yes or no variable just based on what people consider themselves. And suppose that was the, um, uh, that was the dependent variable. Uh, and then we can predict uh, whether someone is a gamer from a variety of factors. So I've chosen here family income in categories of one, two, and three low, medium, and high, presumably. Uh, maybe there was a clarification in the, uh, in the study on like what constitutes low, medium, or high income. And so we have a variety of those here represented uh, as one, twos and th ones, twos, and threes. And then we have the age variable. Um, we could start to make some predictions that, for example, maybe uh, if you're younger, uh, you might be more likely to be an online gamer. Uh, also, maybe if you have more income, more time to waste, so to speak, then you might be a, uh, more likely to be an online gamer. However, as in my research uh, that I've done, um, uh, gaming is not always viewed as a waste of time. It, it sometimes is viewed as something very um, positive and, um, and uh, in, in a variety of ways. So we should not judge uh, as we go through um, the prediction of whether someone is a gamer or not. Uh, we also have some funny combinations here based on the data that I adapted for this example. For example, we have a uh, at least one elderly 75-year-old, um, uh, that person in this case is not an online gamer. We also have an 8-year-old, uh, that person as well is not an online gamer, um, and so on. All right, so for logistic regression, we need to adapt our typical multiple or simple linear regression um, equation and put it as an exponent uh, with an E uh, attached to it, and so I'll show you what that E is. Uh, it comes in your calculator. It's perhaps a, a number that you've seen before, sort of like pi. It just kind of pops up here and there in math equations. Um, so what we do is we have uh, the E constant, uh, and we uh, put the regression equation then in the exponent of the E, uh, and then we put that in a fraction. So we have um, E to the regression equation. Uh, uh, power. Uh, in the top part of the fraction, the bottom part of the fraction, we do that same thing. We add 1, and then that whole thing is equal to y. y is your predicted outcome uh, in this case, whether someone is a gamer or not. So here's the, what that e uh, constant is. This was um, a constant named or perhaps even developed by 
uh, Euler, uh, a mathematician uh, from the past, uh, 1700s, um, and it was not developed for the purposes of logistic regression. It just so happened that it, the application of it made sense uh, when people were developing logistic regression much later in the 1900s. Um, it's a useful, it was developed uh, as calculus was being developed, and it's a useful value, just like I said, like pi is a constant uh, that kind of pops up sometimes. Uh, the E value is 2.71828, and it continues on, so there's more decimals um, if you're to type it into your calculator or ask Excel to get the value, um, uh, then it would give it to you more exactly. So the theory here, like I mentioned, there's maximum likelihood theory that comes with logistic regression and uh, sort of underlies the use of the E constant and so on. Um, generally, maximum likelihood is, was also not specifically developed for logistic regression. Generally, it was developed when you have a data set and you have a particular mathematical equation or model that represents the data. And you're trying to figure out if there is a connection between them. So you're, maybe you have a, a theory or a hypothesis and you're trying to match it to your data. Um, well, that's, that's a little bit like hypothesis testing, right? You're making a hypothesis and you're trying to see if your data supports it. Here we're uh, making an equation or a model um, and matching it to our data. And we're trying to see if the two uh, coincide or how closely related they are. And we try to maximize the likelihood of that happening. Um, and so that's the theory here. Um, so in, in the case of logistic regression, we're trying to uh, figure out the values of B and A for our equation that maximize the likelihood of obtaining the observed outcome values, obtaining the observed uh, um, zeros and ones, uh, or uh, the observed pattern of online gamers. So here we have, um, for our example, what are the values of B and A for our equation that maximize the likelihood of our um, particular pattern of zeros and ones. So in order to do that, uh, we start with that E constant, uh, and then we take the natural log of the equation. The natural log is ln in your calculator, um, and this is uh, um, to get your regular equation back again. Um, so what, what's the purpose? Well, first of all, what, what is an ln? An ln is a logarithm. You guys remember logarithms from the past, or it might just sound familiar. Um, if you are unfamiliar, or you're like, I have no idea what a logarithm, is that like something that floats down the river, a logarithm? I don't know what that is. If that's you, <laughs> maybe, uh, then uh, feel free to Google or YouTube uh, logarithms um, and just get a quick review. This is not gonna require an in-depth review of any kind. Uh, but a natural log is a, a logarithm with its base equal to e. So if the natural log of x equals y, then e to the y equals x. So there's like an, an algebraic transformation that occurs here. You take the natural log of both sides, let's say, of that e to the y equals x equation. If you take the natural log of both sides, on one side you just get y because the e cancels out, and on the other side you get the natural log of x. Um, so this is an algebraic property that, again, is based in calculus and Euler going back to the 1700s. Uh, for example, uh, like in the bottom there, the natural log of E is 1. That's a property of this situation here. The natural log of the E constant is equal to 1, and the natural log of 1 is equal to 0. So there's some properties here that come along with the E and the, and the natural log. This equation, if we're getting our regular equation back, like I said, so the the, um, sometimes this is useful uh, to get your uh, b1, x1, b2, x2, um, and a back into regular uh, form here. This is known as the logit version or the um, natural log version of our logistic regression equation. So the natural log of y over 1 minus y is equal to your regression equation. And this is algebraically equivalent to what you saw here with the y out in front. Um, and the e to the exponent regression equation. Um, uh, these are uh, algebraically equivalent versions, uh, versions of the same logistic regression equation. So how do we find our values for b and a? Well, we could use some calculus. Uh, um, we could do this by hand. Um, we could have a lot of fun. Uh, we can all um, look this up. We can Google and YouTube and um, look up our old calculus books to find uh, more on this uh, process of um, using uh, Euler's constant, or we could just use SPSS, and that's what we're going to do. This is a psychology class, so 
Um, I kind of flew through that. Like I said at the beginning, this was a uh, just an introduction to the theory of why we use um, natural logs and ease and what maximum likelihood means and concept. Um, but we can follow up as you guys wish. Some of you probably have great curiosity as to how this came about, skepticism. Others of you are like, I really don't care. Let's just get to the point and get these numbers and interpret for the purposes of my thesis uh, or my research or my future in as a psychologist. So um, you guys are going to be a little bit different on that those dimensions. That's fine. Um, and I'm happy to, to accommodate either way. So uh, these are the numbers that we're going to get from SPSS. I'm going to do this in just a second. Um, the 1.094 is your B1 value, the slope for X1. X1 is your first independent variable, which was family income in this case. Um, and that's a positive slope, so that's suggesting that family income has a positive relationship between it and the dependent variable. Uh, the 0, 1 um, dependent variable in this case is 0, not a gamer, and 1, a gamer. So perhaps as income increases, you're more likely to be a gamer. And then the negative there, the negative 0.043, uh, applies to age, that is x2, so that's a negative, so at perhaps again, um, as, in, uh, uh, as age increases, you are less likely to be a gamer. So I say perhaps because there's a little bit more depth to the uh, interpretation here than there was for multiple regression, and we'll get into that uh, here as we go along. But let me show you how to get these numbers in um, SPSS. So here's the data uh, entered in. You just enter um, your categorical dependent variable there as a yes, no, uh, zero is no, and yes is one, um, and then the other two uh, independent variables. I, I haven't uh, labeled the one, two, and three for family income because we're gonna treat that as a continuous variable with three being the highest and one being the lowest. Um, and we can do that um, since the uh, income categories uh, fall in order um, that way. And then age, of course, is a continuous variable as well. So we're gonna go to analyze, regression, and binary logistic. Uh, you might notice that there's also a multinomial logistic category. We'll get to that um, toward the end here. But most of our focus and most of the logistic regressions that you see in psychology literature are binary logistic regression with just two categories for your dependent variable. Okay, so uh, we're going to move our online gamer dependent variable over to the dependent category. We're going to put family income and age over to the covariate section. I don't know why it's called covariates rather than independent variables. Uh, for SPSS purposes, it's the same thing. So we're just going to click through and click OK and we're gonna get our output, and this is just gonna give you your B and A values. Um, uh, initially, we're just gonna interpret those, um, and then we're gonna move forward to some of the other statistics that are useful. Um, so where do these uh, numbers fall in? Well, you have your 1.094 under family income. One thing you notice, this is the bottom box here. One thing you notice is that the constant is used to be at the top for a multi, um, for a multiple regression. The top row, now it's at the bottom. So. Uh, I don't know why they flipped that order, but um, anyway, 1.094 is the first value now in the capital B column. That is your slope for family income. Negative 0.043 there is the slope for age, and then negative 0.933 is your constant or your A value. And when you see on the along the left side there, we're going to plug those values back into the equation. We're going to do it both top and bottom uh, due to the uh, format of the logistic regression equation. Um, and uh, then the bottom part of the fraction there has the one or the one plus, uh, and that's the unique component there. Okay, so uh, where do we go from here? Well, we can make predictions. So for participant number one, um, that participant was not a gamer, and income was the lowest uh, level at one, and it was a 27-year-old participant. So um, what we do here then is we make a prediction. We plug in our, our Bs and our uh, A value into the equation, uh, and then we also plug in 1 and 27. So the 1 goes in for x1 there, you see, and 27 goes in for x2. Those are our actual values for the independent variables, uh, income and age for this person. Um, and so then our predicted value is 0.269, suggesting that if, let's say, this value is below 0.5, right, the closer it is to 1, or the closer it is to 0, uh, the less likely this person is to be a gamer. Um, the if it's less than 0.5, right, they're more likely to not be a gamer. Uh, if it's greater than 0.05, they are more likely to be a gamer. Uh, and the closer you get to one, the more confident you are that this person is gonna be a gamer. So in this case, 
they are uh, below 0.5, uh, fairly close to zero. So you're pretty confident that this person, based on the fact that they are 27 years old and in the lowest income bracket, that you're pretty confident that they are not a gamer. For the next person, same process here. Participant number two was 11 years old in the middle income category. And if you plug in two for income and 11 for age, uh, you get uh, 0.686 ultimately. Um, and that is going to uh, suggest that this person is more likely to be a gamer. And for the second straight time, we are right in that they were a gamer, um, or at least uh, according to the self-report, they were a gamer. So um, to get these uh, values uh, through Excel, or if you're doing this on your calculator, you take E to the exponent, and then uh, you do the rest of the um, multiplication, subtraction, and so on in that exponent on the top, and then you do the same thing on the bottom, adding one. Um, so here are your predicted values. You can then go down and kind of compare to see if like there were a couple of participants that were way off. Uh, perhaps uh, our equation seems to be doing a pretty good job uh, for the, at least the first few uh, participants here. So you can go down and look at that. That's the first indication that perhaps your equation is a good one or not. Um, okay, so the odds ratio is the next thing. The odds ratio uh, is also useful for interpreting logistic regression results. Um, and is just an extension of what we've already found um, in our ability to be able to predict what, uh, in this case, whether somebody's a gamer or not. Uh, so the odds of being in the higher dependent variable category when the value of an IV increases by one unit. So um, let me, let's just see this play out in terms of our uh, example uh, to clarify as we go along here. Um, to get it, we're gonna take E to the B. <laughs> sounds like something from a song. Uh, e to the B, it's like a hip-hop song or something. I don't know. Um, the E is the Euler's kind. I'm not sure what I'm talking about. I'm just going to continue talking about logistic regression now. Uh, the uh, E to the B is the Euler's constant is the E value, and the B goes in the exponent. The B is the uh, slope for that particular independent variable value that we just found uh, through SPSS. A positive, so this is why also, I said initially, you can kind of interpret those B values based on whether they're positive or negative. Um, that's sort of an initial interpretation. The odds ratio oftentimes is useful for the reader, the psychologist, someone who is not necessarily up on their logistic regression. Uh, the odds ratio provides a, a second opportunity to clarify what the results mean and what the value of that particular independent variable really is. So what this, this does is it turns a positive slope into an odds ratio greater than one and a negative uh, uh, slope into an odds ratio less than one. And so you can read through these. Sometimes you're like, oh, this makes more sense now. And then you're like, oh, I kind of liked it the first time with just the, the slope um, interpretation by itself. Um, people differ on this. Um, I think last time I taught the class, people actually preferred the slope interpretations without the odds ratio in there. Um, uh, but then sometimes I've seen it the opposite uh, when it comes to um, research articles. People ask for the odds ratio, and then reviewers will of the article will be like, oh, that makes more sense now. So I don't know. Everybody's a little bit different on this. Um, so uh, for that first independent variable we have uh, in our logistic regression equation, that was, um, that was income category. And so uh, as income category increases from one to two, or basically just one unit, the odds that the participant is a gamer increase and are 2.99 time, times greater. So that confirms then that as income increases, you are more likely to be a gamer and by a factor of three times greater per one unit increase in the uh, income category. And the way we got that 2.99 again was to take E and put uh, in the exponent the 1.094, that was the slope for the income independent variable. For the second uh, independent variable, for age, that was a negative b, negative 0.043, so that translates to an e to the b, or odds ratio value of 0.956, um, which is less than 1, and so the less than 1 suggests that as age increases, the odds that you're a gamer actually are not as good, uh, right? So the, that, uh, another way to say that is the older you are, the less likely you are to be a gamer, and that was already suggested by the negative uh, slope value there. Um, and so uh, the odds, in fact, that uh, a person is an online gamer are 0.956 times as great. Now I change it, uh, the terminology there slightly. Um, you could say greater both times, but then it kind of 
Like, okay, so in this one, going back to the first independent variable, 2.99 times greater. That makes sense. The odds are greater. Right here, we say 0.956 times greater. That doesn't really make sense because they're, the odds are actually less if you are older. Right? The odds that you're a gamer are reduced if you are older. So you could say 0.95 times as great. That might make a little bit more sense or be a little bit clearer grammatically than 9.956 times greater. You could also say the odds are reduced. They are 0.956 times as good or something like that. There's various ways to say it. Um, I think it, it comes off the tongue a little bit cleaner uh, when the odds are greater uh, than when the odds are as great. But either way, uh, what we're saying here is that as, as, um, as your age increases in this sample, you are not, less likely to be a gamer. Uh, okay. So for uh, the next uh, part here, we're going to evaluate the overall quality of the regression equation. This uh, may remind you of something from multiple regression or simple linear regression, uh, a particular statistic that we calculated for that to evaluate the overall quality of the equation was, I'm stalling here to give you a chance to blurt out R squared and scare whoever is over next to you uh, while you're watching this video. R squared, or the squared multiple correlation in the case of multiple regression, was what I'm getting at here. Uh, that was the evaluation uh, that allowed for the evaluation of the overall quality of the regression equation or how much variance the uh, independent variables contributed to the dependent variable. Uh, now, of course, with logistic regression, we can't. R, R squared does not apply the uh, once you uh, uh, insert that regression equation into the uh, exponent um, on top and bottom. R squared does not translate over very well. So now, now we calculate a log likelihood. So this is you're taking a uh, a logarithm again uh, because well, the logistic regression is set up in the form of uh, Euler's constant in the, the logarithm format. Um, so we're taking a log likelihood for each person in our sample. I'll show you what this is. We're going to add these up and then multiply the sum by negative 2. Yeah, of course. Why didn't I think of that? Uh, so it just it seems very random, um, at least on for if you've never seen this before. It seems kind of like, wow, negative 2? Like at the end, yeah, add them up. Okay, maybe there's we'll see some logic to that. Multiplying the sum by negative 2... Well, I will just have to, we'll have to watch it play out, and then I'll, maybe I'll offer an insightful um, explanation of that negative 2 by the end. Or maybe I won't. We'll see. Uh, all right, so, um, so we calculate this value once for the logistic regression equation um, uh, that we have. So in this case, we're going to do that with the um, income and um, age variables in there. And then we're going to do it once over again, or we're going to allow SPSS to do it once over again with the independent variables removed. And so now this is starting to make a little bit more sense maybe because when we did R squared, we were wondering, okay, what's the percentage of variance accounted for by the IVs? We're kind of doing that with the, um, with, by calculating this log likelihood value. Uh, and then if you remove the IVs, it's sort of like a comparison that R squared was kind of built in, right? R squared is like a percentage of variance compared to zero. Right? Zero would be the percentage variance accounted for if there were no IVs. Right? Here we have to create that zero, uh, essentially. We have to create that by removing all of the IVs and calculating a logistic regression um, log likelihood there, and then do another one with the IVs in there, and we subtract. And if there's a significant difference between having the IVs in there and not having the IVs in there, uh, then our equation is a good one. So the advantage here is that uh, we actually get a um, a significance value, a p-value, uh, to evaluate um, the significance of all of our IVs collectively or the overall quality of the regression equation, um, the IVs um, that is uh, predicting the dv. Okay, so here is what your log likelihood LL uh, equation looks like. Uh, this is a sum. So the sum, the sigma out there in front uh, indicates a sum. And then all of these uh, values in here are... Um, values that we have uh, found already or we were about to find uh, before. Um, the y with the hat over it, that is your predicted y. The y without the hat over it uh, is the actual y value, the 0 or 1 uh, value in the dependent variable. And then the, the i in the subscript is just for that particular person. So we're doing, let's say, the actual y value for person number 1 multiplied by the ln of that same person's predicted value 
and then adding the second term, same way. And then you go to the next person, you go to the second person's actual uh, y value multiplied the natural log of that uh, same person's uh, predicted y value. <sighs> okay, and you do that for each person. We're going to have uh, uh, one term for each person, so you add them all up. Uh, here in this slide, I have some, uh, again, some reminders of what a natural log is, um, just because that may not be um, uh, too fresh in your memory from having studied it in the past, or maybe not fresh at all. All right, so uh, here's participant number one, and I'm including in uh, here the predicted value as well. So if you recall earlier in the video, earlier in the notes, we made a prediction uh, based on that person. That prediction was 0.269, or um, uh, a pretty low um, uh, predicted value there, uh, suggesting that that person was unlikely to be an online gamer. You take that value, uh, and you also take the zero, uh, which was the actual uh, value that this person was not a gamer, um, and you plug in the zero in for the y with the i and the subscript, uh, you plug in the 2.269 uh, in for the predicted value, uh, or the predicted y with the i and the subscript and the hat over it, um, and you've got zero times the natural log of 0.269, that just becomes zero, and then uh, one times the natural log of one minus uh, point. Two six nine. So, uh, when your variable is, is coded as zero and one, typically one of one or, or the other of those terms drops out of the equation. In this case, the first term drops out of the equation, and you're just left with the second term to give you a negative 0.313. Now, by itself, that negative 0.313 is hard to interpret uh, until we do this. Until we repeat the calculation for everybody else, add them up, and multiply ultimately by negative two. Now, that negative two is going to turn a negative into a positive, um, and so that's going to be helpful in uh, in our conversion um, uh, and our interpretation. So you see that negative 0.313 there in the first term. I'm going to let you guys um, fill this in. Uh, the rest, this will give you practice taking natural logs um, for that second person. For example, you're going to take the 1 uh, that is the actual value and the 0.686, which is the predicted value. You're going to plug those in. You're going to be taking natural logs of the predicted value and also the natural log of the 1 minus the predicted value and so on. Uh, down the line, um, and then you're going to sum them up at the end and multiply it by negative 2 to get your log likelihood ultimately uh, to be interpreted. So this negative, uh, negative 5.37, that is your sum. So if you're going to cheat a little bit, you're going to go to the sum here. Uh, it's going to be negative 5.37 once you take all those log likelihoods and add them up for all 10 people. And then you have a negative value. That negative 2 then uh, is multiplied by that negative to, be, to create a positive value. And so you can do this for your regression equation in the homework and also here in the, uh, the notes for practice uh, to get 10.74. Now that 10.74 is a comparison value. Uh, it's the one that you need, but it's, it's going to be compared to the one that I mentioned, which is the same value but with all of the uh, independent variables removed. So if you remove all IVs from the equation, there's no equation left. Um, but the log likelihood sum multiplied by negative 2 is still 13.86, and so it's not 0. And so then we need that value as well in order to be able to uh, start our interpretation. Um, so if you're, if you're skeptical here of the negative 2 or of the process, again, I encourage you to be so, and we can follow up with additional information in class and um, online. And if you have more insight, if you're like, I know why the negative 2 is there, let me know. Uh, that would be exciting for me to, to learn, but also probably not necessary for this class. Um, so I don't know. It may, may not be exciting for everyone, uh, but it'd be kind of fun for me to look into. Um, I do enjoy maximum likelihood theory, even though I still at this advanced stage of my career don't understand all the ins and outs of it. But anyway, uh, you've got the 13.86. You know, I'm the first to be humble when I don't know everything about statistics. Uh, but uh, um, anyway, I've been doing logistic regression for quite some time, so I'm quite familiar with this negative 2 times the sum of the log likelihood. Uh, well, anyway, it's, it's fun. If you, like, if, you like, uh, if you like statistics, it's fun stuff. 13.86, then uh, you subtract 10.74. This is the difference between the equation with the IVs in there and the equation without the IVs in there. The 3.12, then, is used for interpretation. And ultimately, uh, from a practical perspective, that negative 2, that sum... The reason we do some things to it after we sum them up and the re reason we sum and multiply by negative 2 is ultimately because we're converting what we have to a chi-square distribution. Um, and so if we were to look at 
uh, a bunch of logistic regression models um, and graph them out, plot them out with their log likelihood functions, um, that would fall, that, uh, that distribution would be chi-square. It would fall in a chi-square distribution. Uh, just like the, um, what else has fallen on a chi-square distribution so far in this class? The, the missing completely at random test ultimately is a, is a chi-square test um, as well. So chi-square comes in, um, sort of like the normal curve comes in as a um, something that just pops up in, in distributions of data uh, and is useful uh, beyond um, perhaps how you originally thought it would be useful when you first learned about chi-square and the normal curve. So anyway, uh, moving on, we have the 3.12, which is again the uh, sum of the log likelihoods of each person in our data set multiplied by negative two, and then the 13.86 is the same thing, but with all the IVs removed. Uh, so this value falls in a chi-square distribution. Degrees of freedom is equal to the difference in degrees of freedoms, degrees of freedom between the two regression equations, the two regression equations being the one with the IVs in it and the one with the IVs. Uh, removed. Now, for practical purposes for you, you can, you can calculate this 10.74, which is what we did back here, what I'm encouraging you guys to do as an example here. But uh, from SPSS, we can grab the 13.86 and we can also grab the degrees of freedom values. So for practical pur purposes, I'm trying to get you a little bit of understanding of where these numbers come from, but uh, not have you do the whole thing. So, um, so you can, like I said, you can grab those values from SPSS. Uh, the degrees of freedom for the full equation, this is how it is. it comes to be in SPSS. You do two times, or I should say two, that's not a multiplication, that's two for the number of IVs, that's two IVs in the equation, plus one, which is the constant, so that's three in the equation. And then the degrees of freedom for the equation with the IVs removed is the one for the constant plus zero, because there's zero IVs in there. So the difference that we need here is three minus one. And typically two then is your degrees of freedom. And typically that value for degrees of freedom matches how many IVs are in the equation. So um, there's a little bit more to it than just saying it's the number of IVs in the equation. But if you're trying to uh, take a shortcut there, you can say, oh, there's two IVs in the equation. So the degrees of freedom is probably two. And you can look in SPSS and look at this slide to confirm that. So uh, we have our uh, 3.12 with two degrees of freedom. Uh, and then uh, what we go to uh, here is the chi-square critical value table, or just a chi-square table online. I'm going to let you guys do that because you're all uh, super experts in Googling chi-square table, uh, I'm sure. So uh, you can do that. Use alpha 0.05 in this case is fine. Um, uh, and the two degrees of freedom, you get 5.99 as a critical value. And so then, like I mentioned before, this actually gives you a significance test. And so thus we can say the, the independent variables in this case do not explain, after all that, the independent variables do not explain significant variance in the dependent variable. Um, uh, so uh, for our example, family income and, and age of the participant, those are your IVs, do not uh, explain significant variance in um, whether the participant is an online gamer or not. Okay, so there's a couple things that I need to show you in SPSS uh, that we just completed in the um, explanation in the PowerPoint notes. Uh, the first one uh, is just the odds ratios, which automatically appear uh, here to the right of the p-values for each um, independent variable. So uh, for age, you've got the 0.958 uh, there in the second row, and then back up in the first row, you've got 2.986 uh, for family income, um, and that is your uh, those are your odds ratios. Again, you take 1.094, which is your uh, B value for slope for uh, income, and uh, put that in the exponent. Uh, so you go E to the 1.094, you get 2.986, and then negative 0 0.043 uh, uh, for age um, gets put in the exponent as well, um, and that gives you 0.958. So those are your odds ratios. It says EXP parentheses capital B um, for whatever reason to denote. Um, odds ratios. So that's one thing. The other thing is the um, uh, the log likelihood statistics. So it gives you some, but not all. So um, in order to uh, make sure that we have all the statistics we need, I'm going to go back to analyze regression binary logistic where we were before. Uh, again, if like as as in previous um, videos, if you're doing this all in one step, you can then select this all in one step at the beginning. But I'm going back. Because uh, we didn't select this initially, 
um, and that was to go to options and iteration history. And what that's going to do is it's going to give us the uh, the uh, before and after uh, log likelihood sum values that we need. So options, iteration history, continue, uh, click through. Okay, so in the output, um, you just need to scroll a little bit up from the bottom um, up to block. I guess it's block zero is SPSS's code for the equation with all independent variables removed. Um, and so then uh, you see here that negative two times the log likelihood, 13.86. That's the, the, the value that we needed to grab from SPSS here, uh, representing um, the equation with the two IVs removed. Then you scroll back down again to block one and you see, you just go to the bottom here of the iterations uh, for step one, um, which uh, is SPSS's code for um, entering in the two independent variables back into the equation. And so you're going to see here under the negative two log likelihood uh, column, you're going to see 10.74. That's the other value you need. In fact, you have that again down here in model summary. Um, so you didn't actually need to go back and select that iteration history to get that value, but you did need to go back and and do it to get the 13.86 or the uh, log likelihood with the IVs removed. So, um, so that's uh, those are the values you need. Then you can do go ahead and do this subtraction on your own, or you can also look at um, uh, omnibus tests of model coefficients. Uh, I'm not sure why they call it omnibus, but anyway, um, the 3.12 shows up there as well as the two degrees of freedom and the p-value 0.210. Okay, so the other way of uh, screening your data for logistic regression is uh, uh, to look for uh, uh, residuals, errors of prediction, um, and try to figure out if there's any uh, multivariate outliers in this way. If there were any, uh, in this case, um, gamers that we predicted really poorly, um, and so then maybe that person at that step could be kicked out of the, uh, the data set. Although, if they didn't show up in the multi multivariate outlier check um, with the Mahalanobis distance, um, and with, especially with such a small sample, we're probably going to leave everybody in, even if we wildly missed on the, on the uh, prediction here. So uh, the check of residuals is mostly going to come in handy when you have larger data sets and maybe something uh, unexpected pops up that wasn't caught in the uh, standard outlier checks. So in this case, um, we should look at it anyway, even though we have a small data set uh, for practice. So we have the um, residual, first of all, the non-standardized residual. The regular residual is just zero for the first person. Uh, there minus 0.269, the observed uh, y value minus the predicted y value. And so you can do those uh, by hand or in Excel. Um, and then the standardized residual, we're going to get those in SPSS. Um, and the process there is just to standardize. It's actually standardizing both y and uh, the predicted y uh, first. And then um, so those become standard z-scores uh, versions of themselves. Uh, and then you calculate the residual uh, uh, accordingly. So, uh, but I'm not going to ask you to do all that um, uh, in uh, your homework. I'm just going to ask you to grab uh, these from SPSS. So we're going to go back to analyze. Again, you could have done this in the first step, but I'm kind of going back just to highlight the difference here. Uh, you're going to go to binary uh, logistic again, and we're going to go to save and then standardize residuals. And so you'll see how this plays out here as we click through, click OK. And uh, the output's going to be the same. So you're going to go back to the data and you're going to see a column here of uh, standardized residuals. Now those should match what you have in the um, PowerPoint notes. And so what do we do with those is the question. What we do is we just look for um, outliers. And so we go back to our original data screening outlier check and we're like, well, if any of these is greater than 3.29 or less than negative 3.29, that's going to be an extreme enough outlier uh, to call for um, some action, maybe uh, removing that person from the data set or for otherwise identifying what happened with them and their crazy values. Um, so in this case, we don't have anybody that qualifies. The highest one there is 1.79 for the sixth person. Uh, that was a 31-year-old um, low-income gamer uh, who probably deserves to be in the data set, just like, just like that 8-year-old gamer. No, 8-year-old non-gamer in line number 8 there. Anyway. So uh, um, that's your additional residual check. Um, so we're going to head back to uh, the notes, and I'm going to talk a little bit about multinomial, multinomial logistic regression, which allows for more than two categories of your uh, logistic regression model. 
Um, that is, uh, instead of 0, 1, you can have 0, 1, 2, or even 0, 1, 2, 3, as many categories as you want. Um, and this will result in, uh, in additional logistic regression formulas, um, which will be fun to look at uh, as we go along. So uh, what I've um, included for our uh, example here is a third category. Uh, zero is still not an online gamer. One is now an online gamer uh, that plays less than two hours per day. And then number two is an online gamer that plays more than two hours per day. Now two hours per day may seem like a lot, um, but in our studies in the lab, we find that there are quite a few people, um, even, even CSUN psychology majors, that qualify as more than two or even three or four hours per day that play games. So nothing to be ashamed of if you are one of those people. Um, uh, because there are many others like you. Uh, so anyway, um, we can imagine that there might be different hypotheses for people who are sort of casual, occasional gamers versus people who are uh, more consistently uh, in front of their screen or wearing the headset or whatever else uh, a gamer might do. Okay, so multinomial logistic regression uh, is the example. Uh, and I'm not going to go in, into this in uh, fantastic depth. I'm just going to uh, show you what this looks like and then... Um, lead you to the equations. There's going to be more than one equation now. If we have three categories as we do, there's going to be two logistic regression equations. If there were four categories, then there, will, there would be uh, three uh, logistic regression equations. And so you'll see how this plays out here. So um, I've expanded the data set a little bit to include some uh, extra avid gamers, two hours per day or more. And uh, so we see I added in a 63-year-old gamer and also a four-year-old gamer uh, into the bottom there of the, um, of the chart. Uh, so uh, if your DV has three categories, like I said, uh, as we do now, uh, we now have two logistic regression equations that are set up identical to each other. Uh, the IVs in each are the same. Uh, the first equation then predicts the probability that a participant is not an online gamer. That's category zero, right? Category zero is not an online gamer. The second equation predicts category one, which is the probability that a participant is an online gamer less than two hours per day. And then the third category is used as like a reference category. So it's like once you've established the first two uh, equations, then the third equation is no longer necessary because you have already figured out relative to the first two categories what the odds are of people being in the third category. Um, and so again, you'll see this play out here. Um, so the first one, uh, predicts the probability of category zero, not an online gamer. We're going to run through this uh, in SPSS here in a minute. Here's what, you're, what you get. You get a unique logistic regression equation with your B1, negative 1, 1.524, corresponding to X1, which is uh, your um, uh, income variable, negative 0 0.003, very small value, corresponding to age, and then your um, uh, A value, 3.471. So we can convert these to odds ratios. Um, thus, uh, here, as family income increases from category one to category two, this is the same interpretation um, as a odds ratio for um, a binomial logistic regression. We just have to be careful which categories we're referring to with each one. So this is a negative value for the slope, um, translating to 0.218. And so as family income increases, the odds that a participant are, is not an online gamer are 0.218 times as great, or the odds are less that a participant is not an online gamer. Uh, it's a double negative in this case. So we, if the odds are less that a participant is not an online gamer, that means that the odds are greater that they are an online gamer and by extension. And so we'll see that in the next equation. Um, so the 0.218, again, is less than 1. So... Um, uh, what we're seeing here is that income, as income increases, um, the person is less likely to be not an online gamer or more likely to be a gamer. For the uh, second independent variable, sticking with the same um, uh, logistic regression equation, we had a point, negative 0 0.003. This is for age and the odds that somebody is uh, not an online gamer or is in category zero for um, online gaming, the de dependent variable. So, um, uh, the interpretation here is that um, if you put that negative 0 0.003 into the exponent, you get 0.997 for the odds ratio. As a participant's age increases by one year or one unit, uh, the odds that the participant is not an online gamer, 0 0.997 times is great, very close to one, so it's almost irrelevant. A age is almost irrelevant to predicting whether somebody is not is or is not an online gamer. Um, 
uh, and it's slightly less than one. So you're saying that as the, the older you are, you are slightly, very slightly less likely to not be an online gamer or slightly, very slightly more likely to be an online gamer. Now note that when we say more likely to be an online gamer for both uh, the income conclusion here and the, um, the age conclusion, we're not specifying which of the online gamer categories are more likely. We're just saying uh, it could be either one. And so for example, with the 0.218 here, the odds are greater that someone is an online gamer or reduced that someone is not an online gamer if their family income is higher. Um, but we don't know if family income is higher, whether they're more likely to be in the uh, less than two hours per day category or the more than two hours per day category until we get to the second uh, equation here, which is the uh, predicting the probability of uh, being in the less than two hours per day category. So when we run through this in SPSS, we're getting a new uh, logistic regression equation. Again, the independent variables are income and age. They're the same. Negative 0.577 is your slope for um, income. That's a negative value. And then for, um, uh, for age, it's negative 0 .04, uh, 0.048. And the uh, the A value is 2.945. So what does this all mean? Well, now we're it's the same interpretations, but we're looking at uh, category two uh, now. Uh, I'm sorry, category one now, the, the middle category, category one, which is the less than two hours per day uh, category. So we can look that negative 0.577 uh, corresponded to income translates to a odds ratio 0.562 less than one. So as income increases by one unit or one category, the odds that a participant is an online gamer less than two hours per day is uh, or are uh, 0.562 times as great. So they're not as likely to be in the two hours, less than two hours per day category. If we review, now we go back to the first income odds ratio here. Uh, this was also below one. So the odds were not good, not as good at, uh, of a person being in the not a gamer category. Then we go here, they're also not as good for being um, uh, in the less than two hours per day category. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that per someone with high income is most likely to be in the third category, more than two hours per day, because they're less likely to be in the first category, not a gamer, and they're also less likely to be in the second category, less than two hours per day. So uh, the rich people in our group are more likely to be in the third category because that category is sitting there as the um, reference category. Um, and that's based on the income variable. The age uh, uh, variable is going to turn out with a similar result here. We've got negative 0.048 as your slope uh, in the second equation, uh, looking at prediction of being in the less than two hours per day category. The odds ratio 0.953, less than one again. So as a participant's age increases by one year or one unit, the odds that a participant is in the less than two hours per day category are not as great, uh, not 0.953. And again, if we go back to that same odds ratio for the uh, first independent variable. Uh, we have um, uh, as age increases here, uh, you're uh, also less likely to be in the first category or the not a gamer category. So you're less likely to not be a gamer. You're less likely to be in the less than two hours per day category. So that by extension tells us that someone with more age is more likely to be in the two or more uh, hours per day category. So it's those elderly um, elderly uh, uh, online gamers that are driving this result. Okay, so the other thing I need to show you is the uh, multinomial logistic regression in SPSS. And all I'm going to ask uh, you guys to do is just grab the two equations and interpret from there. The odds ratios will come with the standard output. Um, so I'm going to go up to, Anna. Uh, first of all, I added in um, the third category to the online gamer variable as well as uh, the four people and their data. So you can see I have the zeros, ones, and twos here, and then the four twos have been labeled yes, more than two hours per day, yes, being an online gamer, and then the others that were previously yeses are now yes, less than two hours per day. So you got the zeros, ones, and twos there uh, labeled properly. So you've got uh, the process here under analyze, regression. Now you're going to go to multinomial logistic regression and you're gonna put online gamer in the dependent uh, category. Uh, you're gonna click on reference category and put last category, that's the default. Um, so you don't actually have to change that, but I'm just showing you that because our reference category is the, the as we just covered in the, uh, 
uh, in the process there. Uh, in the PowerPoint notes, the last category is two, and that's our reference category. Um, so we're gonna click continue. That's gonna give us two equations, one for the first category, the non-online gamers, and one for the middle category, which is the less than two hours per day people. So we're gonna put family income and age over to the covariates section. I, again, I don't know why it, for uh, some reason, uh, logistic regression likes us to put our independent variables in the covariate category, just as in binary logistic regression. Um, so we'll do that. We will conform. And I click OK, and uh, we're going to get our two equations here. The first uh, equation is going to be in the um, no section. That's the first category for um, uh, for not an online gamer. And then the second one is, is just directly below in the yes category. Yes, uh, less than two hours per day. And so you see the format is, uh, is similar to uh, what we just saw with the binary uh, logistic regression. It's just as if there's two equations, two um, charts stacked on top of each other. And so if we compare it to the notes here, we go back to our equation for the, going the wrong way. I'm going the, okay, where is it? Uh, it? Okay, right there. So that's the <laughs> prediction that, um, uh, the formula that predicts whether somebody is in not an online gamer category, the not an online gamer category, that's the no category or the zero uh, category. You see here in the capital B column in the output, uh, the intercept, that's your uh, A value 3.471, uh, negative 1.524 is your uh, B1, and negative 0.003 is your B2, and then you go across to the EXP parentheses capital B column, that's your odds ratio is 0.218 and 0.997. Uh, for income and age respectively. And so that's what we just interpreted in the notes. And then we go down here to the second um, category and the second equation, which was right here uh, in the notes. Uh, uh, 2.945, your intercept, negative 0.577, B1 for income, negative 0.048, B2 for age. And then your odds ratio is 0.562 and 0.953. All right, uh, so there's your SPSS for multinomial logistic regression. And if, you, uh, if you're curious about this and you want to kind of go back to that, after all that, all that odds ratio interpretation, you want to go back to that, uh, go back to the data and try to figure out what it means. Well, you're seeing that there's four people in the greater than two hours per day category. Three of those four people have high income. So it makes sense that maybe you're more likely to be in that two, more than two hours per day category if you have high income, right? The other way to look at it is what three of the five people who have high income are in that category. Uh, of more than two hours per day. And then also, if you look at the more, two, more than two hours per day, the four people there, well, there's a 63-year-old and a 65-year-old. And so those two retired gamers are the ones that are causing um, the age category to be reflected, uh, or the, uh, the result that uh, as your age increases, you're slightly more likely to be in the more than two hours per day category. I guess that four-year-old there, <laughs> Uh, was not enough to drive the age effect back down again. Okay, so uh, the moral of the story is when you retire, uh, you should play more games, uh, video games in particular, uh, online games. Uh, that's my plan. Well, maybe it's not my plan, but I did talk about this once with my uh, grad school roommates, and uh, we uh, speculated that when we retire, maybe we should go back to more video gaming. Okay, uh, that's your logistic regression lesson with some wisdom, really good wisdom at the end.